Just push the, the, this button here. Perfect. All right. Here you go. 12 minutes cardiopulmonary bypass, and everybody will be able to put everybody on bypass. So, so it's not going to happen. I'm going to run through this. If you have questions, so look through the book. Um, it's going to give you, obviously, the, the key points. So John Gibbon did the first bypass, used the first cardiopulmonary bypass to repair ASDs um, in 1953. He kind of gave up on that. The patients didn't do real well, but he, he started out, and other surgeons took off, and now we're where we are today. Um, it utilizes roller pumps, centrifugal pumps, uh, cannulas tubing. I'll show you some cannulation techniques, and uh, I'm glad the last... Uh, Speakers talked about blood management. It's a big uh, passion of mine, so we'll talk about that a little bit. So cabbage is uh, probably the number one procedure used on with the bypass machine. About 80% of uh, procedure, about 80% of cabbages are done off, on pump, 20% off pump. So it kind of goes in this uh, way: uh, sternotomy, IMA harvest. Sorry. Um, then. It, Heparinization, cannulation, uh, you rest the heart, do the anastomosis, you wake the heart back up, uh, wean from bypass, and then you uh, reverse the heparin, stop the bleeding. Cannulation, now can I, there we go. So uh, cannulation is usually for central cannulation right here, uh, central uh, using the ascending aorta. So the aortic cannula would go here, the uh, antegrade would go here, if you do uh, dual uh, venous drainage, you don't go here and here, superior and inferior vena cava. And I usually put my uh, retrograde about right here. Um, different cannulas I'm showing you here. These are aortic cannulas, old style cannulas, um, kind of were just tied on to the tubing, and they kind of developed this type. These are the newer type, and most people use these now, and they have like a little triangular, uh, actually a pyramidal structure that's kind of at the end so that the blood doesn't hit the aorta right away. It kind of gets dispersed so you're not uh, creating a bunch of emboli. Um, the venous cannulas hasn't, haven't really changed too much. Holes at the end and kind of at the middle, uh, they're calling it a dual phase or a, some uh, triphase cannulas where they have different holes in different places. Um, I think this is the one I use. It's, really, it's, it's thinner um, so that you're able to drape it over the uh, retractor. Here's a kind of a schematic of uh, the pump. So you got a venous cannula that's going to be in your right atrium. It goes to the reservoir, um, and then the reservoir fills the pump. The pump is filled by gravity, so you'll notice that when I show you the pictures, the pump is always the lowest thing on the whole apparatus. It um, goes through a membrane oxygenator heat exchanger where we can change the temperature of the patient um, and oxygenate the patient and then goes through a filter to stop any emboli and goes back to the uh, patient through the aortic cannula. So here's a schematic, um, this dual venous cannulation, superior inferior vena cava, um, the uh, antegrade cardioplegia cannula, the clamp, the arrested heart obviously, and then the uh, aortic cannula. So on my, the way I do my pumps, here's a, a the, the tubing, the pump is back here. This is passed to me by my uh, perfusionist. It's double wrapped, um, and then the inside it, it's sterile. So they pass it to me. I clamp it off. And you try to cut out as much as you can, because um, you hemodilute the patient. Um, I'm just showing you this bunch of spaghetti here, just to show you that once you pass it off, it's it was marked, and so this is the venous line, and this is the arterial line. You can see that. Uh, one is redder than the other, obviously. So one's oxygenated, one, one's not oxygenated. So the venous line comes up around here, and this is the top of the reservoir right here. So a uh, picture of uh, somebody actually on bypass, 80% saturation, 25% is your crit, and you're at 4.25 liters per minute. Then they have pressure and also, uh, what's that? So see, I'll, I'll show a closer picture of that. Centrifugal pump. Uh, with an impeller and uh, pushes blood. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a good system because it has uh, a couple uh, fail safes. So it, it can't really create a whole bunch of negative suction and pull a bunch of air into, this, into the system. Um, and the, on the opposite end, if you occlude it distal to the pump, it's just going to shut down. It's not going to blow out. 
So it, it works really well for that. Um, there's a membrane oxygenator before it and a, a heat exchanger. So you can uh, cool and heat the patient uh, to what specifications you're doing, whatever case you're doing. Um, let me see, was there one more? So let's just go to this. So here's a picture of the pump. The pump is here. There's a light here just shining on the reservoir. Um, so the venous cannula is here coming in, fills, and then it fills through the, pulls through the pump. The better picture here, um, so the venous cannula would come in here. You'd fill the reservoir up, and the, the perfusionist is always looking at where his reservoir level is. He can't let it drop down because you suck air. Here's uh, the uh, heat exchanger right here. And the pump you see is the lowest thing on all this. And I'll, go, I'll show you other pictures over here. Um, there's a lot going on here, but the pump is just a little tiny thing. Here's a close-up of the pump, blood coming in and going out. The, the uh, other pumps that are there, you have a suction, uh, a sucker, a vent, um, and a uh, cardioplegia cannula, or cardioplegia pump, these three right here. And the, the uh, perfusionist adjusts these as he needs. Um, roller pump works like this. Um, so it's not generating huge amounts of uh, suction, but it's enough to pull things around. Um, and so you use that for your aortic vent, which is in the uh, can same cannula as the anti-grade cannula. And then uh, for pump suction, which I usually only use if it's, uh, the blood's coming directly out of the heart. I use a cell saver uh, if it's not, because you're using a lot of water and cardioplegia, and it's, it's diluted down. So uh, cannulation can be central um, or peripheral, so you can use FEMFEM or, or combined. So you could use FEMFEM, you could use femoral artery, right atrium, you can use uh, axillary artery and right atrium when you're doing some aortic work, you can, you'll use that. Um, Anticoagulation, I keep my uh, ACT above 400 at all times uh, when you're on bypass, and they check it about every 30 minutes. Flow, the flow of the pump can be, you can go four to just about 10 liters of flow. Um, once you get approaching 10, your, your, your limiting factor is the, is the actual cannula. It's not going to be able to flow that high. Um, but usually, if, if you have a big patient like that, then you're going to have to change your cannulation strategy or get a bigger cannula. So and usually, you don't have that. Um, pressures, you, you'll, it's a non pulse dial flow, so you only have one pressure. So you shoot for about uh, 45 to maybe 60 or 70 uh, at all times. I might run it a little higher if someone has some uh, uh, carotid artery stenosis. Um, temperatures, I, on my cabs, I... Uh, drift to about 34. If you're going to do a valve or it's going to be a longer case, you might drift to uh, actively cool down to 32 or 30. And of course, if you're going to do circle rest, then you're going to go down to 18 and pack the head with ice and then do what you got to do and then warm the patient back up. Um, weaning, I like to uh, wean the patient. There's always a discussion with my perfusionist because I, I like to say I wait 10 minutes after after I take the clamp off, I kind of like to wait 10 minutes, let the heart kind of recoup, look at my distals, look over the TE, see how the heart's going. I can never wait 10 minutes. I wait about seven minutes, to tell you the truth. So, but I, I think some of the older guys, they like used to just fill the heart up, come off bypass like in two minutes. I think it's just better just to wait, see how the heart's looking. Now we have TE on all the cases. You can look at the function of the ventricle, make sure there's not, no segments that are not firing properly. Check your graphs. Um, and then come off bypass. Um, blood salvage, let me just say though, I, I, I didn't mention about when you're cannulating um, air. You gotta be on the, on the arterial side, you gotta be very certain no air is in the cannula. On the venous side, you can have a little bit of air in there, it's not a big deal, as long as you're not doing congenital heart. If you're doing congenital heart, then you have to have no air anywhere because there'll be shunts that you won't know about or that you know about, but you, you can tell the congenital heart guys there just dripping water and trying to get every little, you know, every little um, bit of air out of both systems. The arterial, I understand, but the venous, I'm not as, uh, I'm not trying to get every single drop out. Um, blood salvage, I use a uh, cell saver on every case, um, and I, I try not to transfuse people. I really, uh, so I, by cutting the, as much tubing out as you can using the cell saver, um, we uh, use a wrap retro retrograde autologous prime. So 
what we do is we put the aortic cannula in, and then the anesthesiologist raises the blood pressure some, and you bleed the patient back into the pump, and they pull the, the volume back um, and do the same thing with the venous line. You, you, you take the clamp off once you're in there, let the pressure come up, and they pull the, the volume out. That way you're getting all the crystalloid you put in the pump, and so you can get uh, pretty low uh, priming volumes. The patient gets hemodiluted, the hemoglobin goes down, and then you got to transfuse them. Everybody's kind of screaming at you. So. Um, but so I don't like to transfuse. I really think there's too many transfusions in medicine. Um, seven is my hemoglobin number. I'll go through that. There's higher morbidity. The 10-year survival for a cabbage with related patients uh, is, is less with a transfusion. So don't transfuse. And that's for post-operative. The STS uh, monitors this. Uh, so when we get numbers from heart surgery, you get your STS, all your numbers, how many lengths to stay, da da da, your transfusion rate, intraoperative, postoperative, and then both combined. So they're always looking at this stuff. But it, it, it's better for the patient not to transfuse. So it costs more money. Why transfuse? So this is, what, this is from the STS. So intraoperatively, um, if I'm on pump, if the hemoglobin is 6 and the... Uh, SVO2 is low, lactate levels are maybe high, or base deficit's high, all right, then I'll think about transfusing, but that's kind of my trigger. Uh, Postoperatively, hemoglobin is 7 with uh, hypotension and organ dysfunction. Of course, ongoing bleeding trumps everything you got to transfuse. But I've had to fight with a lot of people, a lot of uh, nurses and uh, physicians, when they see the number 7.2, they're like, ugh. Oh. You gotta say no. We don't need to transfuse. The patient's blood pressure is fine. They're stable. Leave them alone. They're gonna be fine. Give them iron. The pump, um, roller pumps here. Um, heater cooler here. Let's see, I'm just gonna go through this fast now. Um, this is I put my cell saver off the back of the uh, end of the table. So here's there's that, and there's a better picture of it in the front. You spin it down, and so for a Regular cab, you'll, you'll give back a bag or so of, of cells spun down. That way you get your hemoglobin uh, back to where, almost to back to where you started if you, if you cut enough of the tubing out. I'm showing this just to show that you give oxygen and uh, anesthetic. So once you go on bypass, you can, uh, the anesthesiologist can leave the room. So, some places do that. In Georgia, that's what they used to do. And he, here, they do not do that, but the, technically they can do that. Um, Here's a, so here's a cannula, uh, sorry, the venous and arterial coming down here, the venous coming in here. Here's the reservoir down to the pump. Remember, the pump is the lowest thing because it's, it's, it's filling by gravity. Heater cooler right there. Here's the uh, 4.64 liters per minute is the flow. Uh, pressure's 207, and the RPMs is 2,700. This, and this, this knob right here is what controls it. Um, Cannulation here, venous cannula coming out here, arterial cannula coming around here, around the back, and, and um, here's the cardioplegia cannula here. So you try to cut off most, most, as much as you can. Here's the heater cooler, so you just set what temperature you want. So you, you cool down to me, 34, and then and after I finish my mammary, I'm, I'm heating back up. And then same thing with the cardioplegia. You give warm, I give warm cardioplegia first. Um, then cold, then cold while I'm doing the case, and then I give a hot shot to wake the heart back up, and then blood. So this is what a perfusion looks like behind you. Um, some places they're in front of you. Uh, most places in Houston, I think, they're behind you, but you gotta be very certain. You're saying give, give cardioplegia or stop, or the clamp's coming off. They, you gotta be really good communication here, and there's be no doubt of what, what you're doing. And that's it. So now everybody can do bypass. <laughs>